left off with their activity and their employment. Some of the companies who continue to work during COVID are those ones that had uh, a laptop uh, um, made available to the employees. Flexibility in ours, again, this has uh, been happening for quite a while. Uh, when we started our careers, in India, uh, the acts in India did not allow us to work flexible. They had very rigid rules as to when one can start working and when they should stop working, the number of hours and between which time to which time, you know, all that is going. So it's going to be flexible and uh, once again, it's up to the employee and it's up to the employer to um, have an uh, agreement as to which is the desired hours that will suit them. So that's flexibility in hours is going to be the change. And digital engagement, like I said before, there's a lot of face-to-face -face engagement that, were, that happened in the past that's happening even now in the prison. But in the future, it's going to be a lot through a digital engagement, through emails, through social media, and all from the digital uh, communications and channels that the work will happen. Um, I'm aware that excluding manufacturing, but other than manufacturing, most of the areas will done, the transaction and the engagement will be through digital engagement. Because of these elements, the leadership styles will vary. The current leadership style is what we are able to visibly look at and we can visibly see what's happening uh, and that will change. The leadership style will now be largely what you're able to display and lead through a remote uh, style. You know, People have to see a leadership through a digital engagement and not necessarily through your physical appearance and standing in front of a, a mic um, uh, in a podium and that gives a lot of advantage in addressing people and also kind of establishing leadership. Now, that uh, liberty will no longer be available because that will change. Now, the leadership style will have to be more in the context of how digitally this can be established. So the leadership has to be uh, seen um, in, in, in forms of the real leadership rather than physical presence. Change and supervision will also change for the same reason. In the past, someone would uh, supervise looking over the shoulder, or if they're working in an office, they can just put their heads up and look at who's working, who's not working, and look at the monitors and see who's uh, slacking and who's working and who's sleeping. Well, now in supervision, in a digital world, that's not gonna be possible. Imagine people working from home, and the manager or the supervisor does not have the, um, the, the freedom or the liberty to look at and observe what's happening. So uh, the supervision will be more in terms of communication, the task that you, um, you forward and the task that is completed and come back to you and you look at the efficiency, how quickly that's being done, how well that is being done. A lot of feedback then is taken from your customer as to how well this has been done. So uh, that's going to change a lot in terms of uh, supervision. So it's not uh, more of output, it's going to be more of outcomes. So we traditionally we always manage output, like you know, how many hours have you worked? How many units have you uh, uh, you've clocked? Now that will change in supervision uh, in terms of uh, managing resources will be more in terms of outcomes. How well do you get things done? How much does it satisfy, satisfy the customer? So, so from an output to an outcome, that's going to be another shift that's going to change. And again, multitasking. We are traditionally used to working in silos. A specialist, there are a lot of respect in saying the specialist, uh, he's the, the single most uh, source for knowledge in this particular area. Now that's gone. People are looking for cross-functional skills. Um, you're going to have a smaller team, but with multiple uh, skills and uh, who's going to work um, multitask and work cross-functional within a team is what is going to uh, be the future. So if you're looking at a career, just to be someone specialist, specialized in one area, uh, probably the future is not going to be very um, uh, supportive of that. And uh, the other thing is that the, the data-driven decisions, data-driven um, uh, um, management, everything is now going to be based on uh, data. In the past, we would work based on uh, what we look at, what we, uh, based on emotions and feelings. Now, that's how it's worked so far, especially in India. Uh, we give a lot of value to those. We look at emotions, we look at feelings, and we look at um, the people, and, uh, and then we make decisions. Now, what's changing now is it's all going to be based on data. We need empirical evidence. So the, the our work function, our efficiency, our success, everything is going to be um, based on 
uh, how well the data supports what you claim to have achieved. So um, this is how the world is going to change. So th this is the future. Okay, all right, so moving on. Um, the topic also uh, was related to emerging sectors. So uh, um, we've so far looked at what is changing. And uh, we know that COVID is there in the present and we don't know how long it's going to be in the future, but it has changed the world. It's changing the world drastically. But um, in terms of emerging sectors, it's not something that is happening now because of COVID. The emerging sectors are, were always there and it was uh, happening for a while. And um, I've got a list of emerging sectors, again, at the macro level. So let me share with you the first one. This is probably of more interest to you, um, EdTech. Like, you know, we've got FinTech, I'll talk about it a little later, and we've got um, um, the digital marketing. EdTech is the new education sector. So education now is not about just classrooms. It's not about just talking to and managing students. It's all about how do you do that in a new world using digital technology. So education is now moving from classroom to a technology uh, uh, enabled platforms and through which uh, education is imparted through those who are sitting at the other end. And this is going to bring about new skills in terms of technology, how well you present in, a, in, an elect, in an electronic medium, how well you keep your students engaged and how well um, you're able to review and progress. So this is new for India, but uh, relatively new, but um, it has happened uh, overseas for a long, long time. And uh, you can see uh, Baiju in India, which is a leading uh, online uh, education portal. So for especially those who are here, academic um, uh, professionals, EdTech is a huge change for you. Your world is going to change significantly. Uh, quickly, I'll share an example of what happened back home in my place. A leading uh, university over 100 years, one of the top listed global universities, invested in a new building, uh, which had a project um, about two years to buy a space and build it. By the end of the two years, they found out university does not need classrooms anymore. So the whole business model crashed. So what universities are now building, are building hubs where people will come, and um, sit and uh, uh, plug in the laptops, have good Wi-Fi, and possibly have team uh, uh, meetings, engagement, and have a review with the professors and they go back to their homes. Libraries are no longer relevant. They're all digitalized, oh, yeah. all online libraries. So EdTech, this is a huge change for you, but this is where the emerging sector is. If you keep equipping yourself, and if you get um, uh, well aware of what's happening in this particular function, in this particular area, look out, EdTech is the future for you. E-retail, I don't have to explain much about this. Uh, we all know Amazon, we all know Flipkart. And during time of COVID, when we had curfew, I even bought vegetables through online. A big basket, excellent uh, uh, delivery. And we never thought one day we would have to buy vegetables and milk through uh, an e-retail platform. Well, that happened. So e-retail, another space, no need to tell people, no need to educate anyone. Everyone knows because we all of us have experienced this and we know this is where the future is. The, the other one is banking and FinTech. Overseas finance is no longer a specialist function. They now call it FinTech, just like EdTech. FinTech is finance and technology club together. Most of all the finance functions are now routed through a digital platform. Banking in particular is going through a lot of changes. As we had seen, it's all moved through an ATM. It's gone through online banking. Job losses are there, but it's all gone back to the back office. Going forward, uh, in Australia in particular, uh, one of the largest big four banks, I've invested in one particular person who's build, building an AI robotic system because the only other place where there's still human intervention in the banking sector is when they engage with customers in approving loans. So they're building an, an AI system. If you apply online, it'll quickly look at your credit, you'll quickly look at your earnings, and it'll quickly, quickly look at your potential and all that. And within two minutes time, it'll approve. It does this now, but this is even more quicker. And um, banking is poised for a big chain. So while banking back office functions are going to be the, uh, an emerging sector, the frontline banking positions are definitely at risk. Likewise, marketing. Uh, marketing used to be the paper, the hoardings, and the television advertisements. That has changed. 
digital marketing is now happening through social media. They use artificial intelligence to find out um, what Selvan is capable of buying. What is my age group? What is my interest? What is the food that I like? How do I dress? And what is my color? And where do I come from? They use all of these analytics to build a profile and do a, a targeted marketing approach so that I end up buying or end up subscribing. So the marketing has completely changed from what it was in the past. It's no more sales and marketing. It's more of digital marketing where social media, um, through social media and digital platforms, much of the activity happens. Again, all of us have experienced this through Facebook and other areas. Medical, uh, and I put in brackets, hygiene. Hygiene is something which is now big on. This is specifically after COVID. Uh, we're not very clean, uh, Indians in particular. We're not very hygienic. We spit everywhere. We put rubbish everywhere. Now, because of COVID, we've been forced not to spit. We've been forced not to throw rubbish around. And um, uh, interestingly, uh, we never even stood on queues before. Now we've made to stand in the queue. There are learnings, and hopefully we continue to move along that. But again, it's a big future for industries, those that are engaged and involved in the, the hygiene. Uh, sector of within the medical uh, industry, uh, sanitizers, gloves, and all that. We've already seen those. But those are big markets. And lastly, IT solutions. Anything and everything that we do in the future would be through a digital platform. And therefore, IT sol solution will be the backbone of what we are, you know, what our future is likely to be. And quickly, I'm not too sure how I'm um, going with time. I won't take more than uh, three to four minutes. And last of all, um, the gig economy, I'm sure by now all of us know what's a gig economy. Gig economy is completely different from what it was. It's nothing like what it was in the past. It's completely refreshing and new. It's a short-term task. It's freelancing. It's an on-demand, and it's a quick turnaround jobs. Swiggy, Yuba, these are classic examples. So anyone and everyone can do this for additional income. And for some people, this can be their main income. So you just log in and make yourself available, take a task and deliver. So it's just not about delivery. I'm not talking about Yuba. I'm not talking about just um, um, the food delivery. You're talking about projects. I'm talking about consulting. Uh, look at Fiverr. And there are lots of other sites. Uh, even for education, you can look, log, take a space, do two hours, get rewarded and move. The feedback is instant. The more positive feedback you get, the more money you make, the more engagement that you do. So this opens cross-functional uh, cross possibilities. So I could be a consulting person, but if I love driving, I would do a pickup and drop service. If I love food, I would do something else. So this is big. This, uh, so, however, this is going to be the future. So there's going to be a lot of short-term tasks. There's going to be a lot of freelancing and less of permanent employment. So this is how it's going to pan out for us. Um, this is one of the quickest uh, uh, presentations that I've ever made. Uh, my longest presentation has been two days, seminars where I've done it back to back singularly for two days. And I've done half an hour, 45 minutes. This is the quickest and I, and I hope that I've done some justice. And I look forward to your questions. And uh, that's about from me. Thanks Clive and thanks for all of you for your patience. Thank you so much, Selvin. It has been really a pleasure listening to you. You put, uh, as you said, maybe the two days webinar, you put it in about just 25 minutes. It's uh, too difficult to digest, but I'm sure, uh, you know, you provide a lot of deep insights into the complex changes that are taking place. You try to put it in simple terms, how the workplaces are changing, how the leadership is changing, uh, you know, how things are becoming digital, how decision making is changing marketing is changing people's behavior is changing so many things you covered in just about 25 minutes thank you so much it's been really really intellectually very stimulating exercise we'll take the questions later so we will thank move you. on to the next speaker thank you thank you the next speaker is mr rajesh shetty mr rajesh shetty completed mba in international marketing from Department of Business Administration, Mangalore University, way back in 1994. He joined Shaw and Shangi Group, Mumbai, as a management trainee. Currently, he's heading Tire Souls India Private Limited, one of India's leading tire trading and vehicle management solution provider, as the executive director based in Mumbai. He has 26 years of experience at senior management levels at several divisions of the group across the country. 
I'm also delighted to say that Mr. Rajesh is our proud alumnus. His topic for the day is emerging employment opportunities and preparing the students in this transition period. Rajesh, please take over. Good morning, everyone. Am I audible? Yes. Yes. Thank you yes. very much uh, for the opportunity. Uh, I'm grateful uh, to the Alma Mater, Crossland College, uh, Principal Professor Samuel K. Samuel, uh, moderator of today's uh, webinar, Dr. Robert Clive. In fact, I am very much delighted to share the panel with uh, two HR professionals, uh, one with very rich experience, uh, mm -hmm. Mr. Selvin Thomas, whom we have heard right now. Um, congratulations, uh, Selvin, for those wonderful insights uh, into this uh, topic. Uh, we you. also have a budding HR uh, executive, uh, Mrs. Ria Raichu Samuel. I'm very happy to be sharing the panel with them. Uh, I understand that uh, majority of the audience today uh, are from the teaching faculty, and it is indeed an honor to address uh, all of you because you are instrumental in uh, molding the young minds. Uh, so you have a huge role to play during a scenario like this. Well, uh, in my presentation, uh, I'm, I'm broadly touching upon uh, four aspects. Uh, the first one is how to look at a crisis. Uh, the second one would be, uh, what is the emerging employment scenario? Uh, the third aspect would be, what should be our strategy uh, to stay relevant? Uh, and last one, but not the least, what roles the educational institutions can play uh, in preparing and grooming our young talent for the challenging times uh, ahead. So I want to share a couple of images in my presentation, uh, share a few examples from my experiences so that you can relate to the topic uh, better. So let me begin with the first aspect of uh, today's topic is uh, how to look at a crisis. Uh, so in my view, uh, crisis is very good. Uh, crisis acha hai. Um, because every crisis will have a short-term impact and it will have a long-term consequence, uh, good or bad. So some of the sectors may be adversely affected because of the short-term impact uh, and some sectors may be uh, favorably uh, affected like the farmer today uh, is gaining uh, a lot of advantage maybe the uh, home entertainment uh, online shopping is gaining a lot of advantage at the same time perhaps the uh, tourism and hospitality and uh, travel industry is taking a big hit uh, but but as i said there is a short term impact uh, and there will be a long term consequence uh, what happens mostly is many of us uh, undermine uh, the threat of any crisis, but most of us overreact. Uh, I think this is time to take a very balanced view uh, because uh, the crisis has basically two broad faces. Uh, one is the downward trend. Uh, there will be a lot of uh, ambiguity there will be a lot of uncertainty. Uh, there will be a lot of uh, insecurity. Uh, there will be lack of confidence. Uh, of hope. Uh, and all these negative sentiments uh, will impact the demand. Uh, and, and then the recessionary trend start unfolding. Uh, but there has to be a bottom. At some point of time, uh, there will be more clarity. We find some solution. We taste some success, we gain some confidence, and there will be an upward movement all the way uh, till the boom. So the big question today is, what is the time frame between these two phases? Uh, whether it will be uh, like a V-shaped recovery or the U-shaped recovery or the L-shaped recovery. Uh, so let us not get into that discussion in this topic, but uh, having said that, when there will be a downtrend, there will also be an uptrend. So uh, we should be prepared for both. 
uh, the crisis will uh, come again and again. So today it's a virus. Uh, before that, it was a war. And before that, uh, it was a scam. Uh, tomorrow, something will fall from sky. Uh, day after tomorrow, something will erupt from Earth. So it's a continuous process. But all of these are beyond our control. There is no point in worrying about something that is beyond our control. What we should be focusing now is how we can react to this crisis, how, can, how we can handle this crisis, how we can manage this crisis. I think that is controllable. So the, my, my, my point now is let us control the controllable. Uh, the third point I would like to make uh, is that every crisis uh, is a catalyst of change. It forces us to look into new ways of doing things, better ways of doing things. It makes us more innovative. Uh, it also teaches us life lessons. Uh, you know, that way, if even a pandemic like COVID has a great academic value. It has taught us lessons which perhaps we wouldn't have learned in schools and colleges for life. Uh, uh, I think it, it pulls us out from uh, our comfort zone and the state of complacency. In my view, uh, complacency is the greatest threat today uh, it is, ha it is uh, having more threat uh, than the virus itself. So uh, to make uh, my point uh, even clearer to you, uh, I would like to uh, share one uh, image in front of you. Is that visible now? Yes, Raj. Yes, visible? it is visible. Yes, it is visible. Yeah. So yeah. this is a very famous uh, boiling frog syndrome. Uh, many of you must be knowing about it. But if somebody needs some explanation, let me explain it very briefly. Normally, what happens uh, is that when the changes are gradual, uh, we don't realize its long-term repercussions and we take it for granted and we don't really uh, adapt ourselves uh, and we don't really uh, become agile and move, uh, take decisions and move quickly. Uh, so uh, when, we, when we start eating very slowly, the frog initially uh, doesn't realize it. Uh, after some time, when the water becomes lukewarm, uh, it, it is it's very comfortable. Uh, and when the heat becomes unbearable, uh, it will continue right now. And by the time it decides to jump out, uh, it would be too late. Uh, on the other side, if, if the change comes suddenly, if the heat is instantaneous, uh, you take this all required uh, leap for survival. So, unfortunately, it takes crisis uh, to pull us out of this comfort zone and uh, make us realize that we have to be very agile and uh, take quick decisions and adapt to the uh, changing scenario. So, from here on, let me move to the... next aspect of the topic. Is that what is the emerging uh, scenario in the uh, employment sector today? So let us look at the emerging employment scenario. Uh, every sector, in my view, has a huge potential uh, and a resilience that it bounces back much stronger, much bigger, and much better. The only difference will be it will re-emerge with the new set of rules uh, and in the new format. Uh, but what, what most of the companies are um, striving for today, uh, if you ask me, uh, 
majority of the companies are striving very hard to stay relevant. Uh, they are upgrading their products, they are upgrading their services, they are upgrading their value proposition, they are upgrading their business models to stay relevant uh, in the current dynamic scenario. Uh, most of them are talking about scaling. Uh, so they don't want to be a marginal player, they want to be a force to reckon with. Uh, so, so they don't want, uh, they don't uh, settle for marginal growth. They, they expect uh, exponential growth. So scaling is definitely another thing which most of the companies are working towards. Uh, every company is today uh, talking about becoming more productive, more efficient, more cost effective, uh, and most competitive, uh, because that is the only way to survival. Uh, many of the companies are today emphasizing on systems and processes uh, because they want to leave little room for human error. Uh, and most of the things are now process driven or system driven. Uh, many companies are today talking about customer connect, customer acquisition, and most importantly, customer retention, uh, faster customer reach, uh, customer engagement. Uh, these are the uh, things that most of the companies are uh, working upon. Uh, and all of us know that all the companies today are trying to become more and more eco-friendly. So you will see a lot of green and clean initiatives taken by uh, each of these companies. Uh, so if you ask me what are the emerging sectors, there can be a long, long list. But I, uh, as I said before that uh, each sector has a lot of potential and resilience. I think it makes sense for us to look at uh, the spaces across the sector uh, that are really uh, unfolding and uh, offering uh, huge employment opportunities rather than the sector itself. So uh, I think today uh, the dig digital space uh, is uh, expanding by leaps and bounds. Um, whether it is sales and marketing, whether it's accounting, across the function, across industry, uh, across the sector, uh, everywhere we find the digital space is uh, expanding. Uh, people are extensively using the apps, the web portals. Uh, There's huge amount of uh, software development happening uh, where the transactions could be seen online. Uh, E-commerce is uh, emerging in a big way. So the digital space is definitely one where most of us should think how we can really adapt uh, to that space. Uh, the second space I would say is the designing space where, where uh, designing is no more uh, considered only to appeal to your aesthetics. Uh, it is not just about fashion designing or interior designing. Designing today is seen as um, a solution to the problem. So you can design a tool, you can design a machine, you can design a process, you can design a project, you can design a city. So uh, the scope is enormous. Uh, I think the creative space where, where uh, you do innovative things and uh, especially in the era where we are concentrating more on brand building, uh, there will be a lot of space uh, with, for the creative minds. So these are the things we have to identify uh, and we have to uh, upskill ourselves to meet uh, this kind of requirement. Uh, moving on to the third aspect uh, of my presentation that how can we adapt to these changes? So what should be our uh, strategy? So if you um, uh, see the biggest, the biggest, biggest, uh, um, requirement in any organization today. Uh, every organization today expects from its team members a sense of ownership. Uh, most of us, we um, tend to take sometimes uh, our job very casually. Uh, many a times we shy away uh, from our responsibilities. Uh, many a times we don't want to take uh, uh, accountability uh, and we don't feel the sense of urgency. Uh, so this is one thing that uh, every employer would expect out of an employee to exhibit 
uh, a sense of ownership in whatever you do. Uh, for a worker, he can exhibit the ownership uh, towards the machine. Uh, an administrative guy can have a ownership towards the process. An accounts guy can have an ownership towards the project. Uh, a sales guy can have a ownership, sense of ownership towards an event that he's organizing. So when, when, when we exhibit this kind of a quality, I think we have better chance to flourish uh, in our uh, employment. Uh, the other thing that is expected of uh, all the employees or the one who is aspiring uh, is That's you are, you have to be receptive to changes. Uh, you should accept changes. Uh, the biggest threat we have in many middle level and senior level today, unfortunately, is that there is a lot of reluctance to change. There is a lot of resistance to change. Uh, and we have to pay a very high price uh, for that as well. Uh, so we need to accept the change and we have to adapt, the, uh, adapt to the change. Uh, we should also start freeing ourselves from various conditions that we have. We should start questioning um, everything like why nine to six job? Why not uh, a job with deferred timing? Uh, as uh, Selvin rightly pointed out, uh, why not a part-time job? Why not a freelance job? Why not self-employment? Uh, why an office job? Why not an outdoor, outdoor job? Why not a transferable job? Um, so, so all these things will now be, uh, now we have to be uh, answered because things are no, not going to be uh, like before, uh, where you would like, uh, you would uh, get a job of your choice um, uh, so easily and it, the case may not be so. Uh, as we go by. Uh, I think we have to be very proactive and agile uh, because there is little time to act. So when something is coming on your way, you have to understand uh, its consequences uh, and you have to uh, act very fast. Uh, so how you can do that? Uh, so the key thing is uh, upskilling yourself continuously. When I say upskilling, uh, it is both hard skill as well as the soft skill but more uh, about soft skill because hard skill you can uh, anyway learn on the job, uh, but soft skills are difficult to learn and uh, practice. Uh, your, your attitudinal and behavioral skills, your communication skill, uh, your time management and stress, man stress management skills. Uh, these things are hard to learn, uh, but, but you can always uh, have uh, time to get into some offline training sessions, some short-term online courses, because the online courses are now becoming uh, more recognized and more credible, uh, and uh, there will be better acceptance going forward. Uh, so continuously, you should be doing that. Um, I have seen an office boy uh, in the mid-90s uh, who hardly knows computers, would work on a computer after the office hours and try to type a document, joins a short-term computer course, uh, learns some basic uh, computer modules, and uh, later on get into some software uh, accounting package and learns it, and eventually becomes uh, an accounts head or a functional head. I have seen a worker um, who, who is very, very uh, innovative in his uh, work and uh, starts reporting uh, through computer uh, and, and uh, takes ownership for most of the things and eventually become uh, a production head. Um, I, I have seen salespeople uh, who learn the art of customer relationships and uh, salesmanship and eventually become uh, the dealers and the boss of their own and earn three, four times more than what they would have earned as an employee. Uh, and they would even earn more than what their seniors used to earn. Uh, so they, they have the entrepreneurial skills uh, out there. On the on contrary to that, uh, I have seen in late 90s, in early 2000, uh, when ERP systems were getting um, uh, implemented, uh, even a middle management, senior management uh, employees are, are very reluctant to it and resisting it. Uh, and have to pay a huge price and spoiling their career altogether. Uh, so these examples tell us that uh, uh, if you sh show the sense of ownership, if you are ready to change, uh, if you continuously 
uh, upskill yourself and if you are very proactive and agile and if you free from your con various conditions uh, there will be a lot of scope for you to flourish so getting a job is one thing uh, staying there and growing and uh, building a career is completely different so coming to the last part of my presentation uh, what role the educational institutes can play um, i believe that this kind of crisis will bring out the best and worst in each individual uh, and industry so it's only a matter of uh, realization of one's own potential within and it has to be followed by some action uh, i think we uh, at the college as the professors um, we can really unlock this potential in each individuals um, through various uh, group activities through various case studies through various um, uh, corporate uh, interactions uh, through various uh, projects. Uh, only thing is, this has to be done in a structured manner. I'm sure many of the institutions today are paying a lot of attention to these kind of uh, activities because uh, the soft skills like um, behavioral uh, skills, uh, communication skills, leadership skills cannot be uh, built easily. Uh, things like uh, integrity, positivity, inclusiveness cannot be instilled in the mind very easily. It has to be done through demonstrations. Uh, it has to be done through practical uh, projects. So there has to be a calendar where the frequency of these kind of activities has to be more uh, so that uh, we, we uh, train them uh, better. Today's youngsters are much smarter than us. Uh, they are very enthusiastic they are full of energy uh, at the same time they are restless uh, they have to gain maturity uh, they are clueless at times so that is where we as uh, mentors come to play uh, that it is not about teaching anymore it is about mentoring it is about about coaching uh, it is about uh, grooming uh, a student towards these uh, these qualities uh, and i'm sure you could do a great job uh, in this direction. Uh, lastly, I would also uh, have a suggestion that we should also uh, prepare our students for a good financial discipline later on. What is happening today is uh, we are busy in preparing them to earn more, but uh, none of us uh, are taught during my, our college days about uh, how to spend wisely, how to save uh, wisely, uh, how to invest right, uh, what are the different asset classes, uh, what is the rate of investment, uh, what is the return on investment, uh, how to spread uh, our risk across uh, various asset classes, how to shield ourselves towards medical and life emergencies, uh, when to borrow, how much to borrow, uh, what is the cost of borrowing, uh, the reason I am telling all of this is we uh, learn it hard way by committing mistakes at the later stage. Uh, and uh, most of the advisors come through a financial advisor uh, who will be definitely biased and will have a vested interest. Uh, instead of that, if we are groomed uh, on a uh, disciplined financial regime in their student days, I think uh, we can handle a crisis like this much better. Uh, because what happens in a crisis like this is there will be definitely pay cuts, there will be temporary job losses. So uh, you have to have a cushion to absorb the shock. Uh, and the cushioning comes through uh, a good uh, financial management. The uh, streams, I, I think this is a common module that you should include and uh, uh, make a student understand the importance of uh, uh, becoming strong on the financial, uh, personal financial side also. So I think that's uh, the time now to wind up. I, I leave with another image uh, in front of you uh, that uh, pretty much sums up uh, my presentation. Uh, let me display that. So is it visible to all? Not it, Rajesh. Ah, yes, now yes. 
Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. So so now uh, this is two beautiful images here. Uh, let us prepare uh, ourselves, our students, for a surfing kind of situation and not for a tightrope walk. Uh, if you if you compare the two images now, that uh, in surfing it's all about excitement, uh, but in a tight tightrope walk it's about anxiety. Uh, so in, in in surfing you are prepared to fall. Uh, a fall is factored in, but uh, you fall, you get up, you surf again. Uh, and that is part and parcel of the whole game. But whereas in a type of walk, uh, one fall could be the end or uh, you, you would uh, uh, be hurt very badly. Uh, but in surfing, again, you see the challenges are coming from every direction. Uh, every wave will be unique. Some wave will be bigger, stronger. So you need to negotiate with each of these views as and when it is. Uh, and in, uh, in, a, in a scenario like of walk, you are focusing only uh, in one direction and thinking about taking one next step. Uh, so in surfing, you have multiple skills. Uh, it's not only about balancing, it is about flexibility, it's about strength, it's about endurance. Uh, but in micro scenario, it's uh, mostly about balancing and you're very much vulnerable uh, to the changes surrounding you. So I think we not get into a scenario where it could be a tightrope walk in our lives. Uh, we should gear up for uh, a scenario like uh, surfing uh, and uh, I'm sure all of our young talents will move in that direction and our teaching faculty will uh, care of this uh, particular aspect. Uh, and I thank everybody for this wonderful opportunity uh, and I wish you all uh, a very healthy, a very safe time during this crisis. Uh, and I'm sure we will come out of this crisis uh, with flying colors. Thank you so much. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Rajesh. You started with a statement about the crisis and hopelessness, but you concluded with the statement we have hope and resilience. A lot of a new you know, insights you could give. In fact, you started looking at the crisis, not as a problem, but as an opportunity. And you also said it's yes, not sir. complacency, but it is more importantly, how we really react to that. And Absolutely. to an extent, the comfort zone that you spoke about to the teachers, uh, maybe even to the next extent that listening to somebody from an industry, there could be a kind of resistance because we are used to listening to people from the academia. So in that sense, you did really bring an insight saying that we need to break that resistance. We need to really uh, look at the emerging things. And you spoke about the boiling frog syndrome. If we are not really getting ready now, it will be too late and we'll be caught unaware. And there were really, really a lot of insights about how things are really uh, changing, you know, instead of taking it as a shock, but we can make use of this opportunity to bring out the potentials in each of the teachers as well as the students. Rajesh, thank you so much for Absolutely. really taking time to share many of these insights. I'm sure thank we can answer to the questions at the end. So thank you. So with that, we move on to the next speaker. She's also going and a brilliant speaker. Mrs. Ria Raichi Samuel. It's my pleasure to introduce Mrs. Ria. She has tremendous credentials to address on the theme, skill mapping and skill development in facilitating students to enter the new job market that is emerging post COVID-19 period. Ria completed her undergraduate degree with a gold medal from Mangalore University and completed her MBA in human resource management from Christ University, Bangalore. She has earned a strategic human resources leadership certificate from Cornell University, USA. She has worked in multiple roles in eight years of her career and has delivered key results predominantly in the areas of HR generalist, HR business partnering, strategic talent management, performance management, strategic employee experience initiatives, HR system implementations and policies and procedures development. She has worked with companies like MR Properties, PJC Dubai's Business Performance Officer, Oracle Financial Services Software Limited Bangalore as HR consultant. And currently she works for 
infra care facilities management service division of gems group dubai as senior hr executive more than all this we are proud to introduce ria as our proud alumna ria please make your make your presentation over to ria hello everybody hi thank you clive sir for the introduction i would also like to thank uh, crossland college uh, all the staff and faculty who actually gave me an opportunity uh, to be a part of this webinar and actually present uh, a subject here uh, so before i start off let me just check am i audible and am i visible to everyone yes yes oh okay. yes so the speakers before me mr rajesh as well as mr selvin has given an idea of what are the emerging sectors post covid 19 also what are certain job opportunities that could come up as well as the skills required i would be focusing more on what teachers can do how teachers can do skill mapping and skill development for their students how teachers can actually help the students be more employable during the times of covid 19 So just give me a minute to share my screen. Is the screen visible? Yes, Ria, you can see your screen. Go ahead. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So the coronavirus I think this one. Can you all mute your microphone please? Okay. Thank you so much. So the COVID-19 pandemic has actually changed the way the entire world works. Every person, every one of us has had to do things which we have never done before. overnight we had to work from homes we had to come up with new ways of doing our job to succeed and to even survive in this market a student who probably a couple of months would have been a couple of months back would have been thinking about his examination applying for higher education is today worried about when the examination is going to happen if at all it happens when are my results going to come out and when my results come out do i have enough time to apply for higher education So this is the way the world has changed in just a matter of couple of weeks. This pandemic has just reinforced a fact that we already knew that change is the only thing that is constant. I'd like to put it in the words of a New York Times columnist Thomas Friedman. Humans who want to adapt in an age of acceleration must develop dynamic stability. rather than trying to stop an inevitable storm it's about building an eye into the storm that moves along with the storm derives energy from it and creates a platform of dynamic stability within it let's take a look at the impact of covid-19 on the workforce i've classified it into three eras starting with the now which was at the outset of the pandemic when businesses were forced to think overnight about working from homes they had to mobilize resources technology in order to enable employees to start working from home face to face meetings were replaced by virtual meetings and in fact employers had to support their uh, employees customers suppliers at the same time ensuring that they stabilize their revenue as well eventually leaders started thinking about the next phase where the employees start coming back to work but the economic recovery is going to be slow as my previous presenters have already uh, presented that you know there could be job redundancies job losses temporary job losses that happen all this eventually probably leading to a decade or so of never normalcy mr rajesh has already pointed out about the uncertainty of how long this impact of this covid-19 would last maybe it's just a couple of months maybe it could go on for a couple of years but one thing that we know for sure is that there are going to be some changes there are going to be changes in cultural norms maybe societal behavior our value system 
handshakes may no longer be viewed as something acceptable the concept of physical space is also probably going to change completely ram krishna is in the businesses are going to adopt some uh, responsible business practices okay. like you know focusing more on hygiene health safety welfare of the employees etc we have seen that we have seen in our neighborhood we have seen in the uh, stores or shops around us that how businesses were forced to rethink the way they work they had to come up with new strategies to survive they had to innovate they had to invent so that they can survive in this market we have seen that you know how our maybe a local restaurant who used to have only a uh, service in there started online services online ordering online payments etc in order to avoid cash transactions the concept of entertainment has changed completely theaters and multiplexes were replaced with netflix amazon prime hotstar etc even musicians have started giving concerts through facebook live and instagram live there are virtual birthday parties and graduation ceremonies being held i understand most of you are from the academic background so how the way of imparting education has uh, changed over the last couple of weeks remote healthcare hospitals have started telemedicine and teleconsulting even uh, with a lot of people working 